um, here at the organization. And I'm so excited to be speaking with all of you today um, about a topic that is both timely as well as important. For those of you who are looking to ask a question throughout the program or at the end of the program, uh, raise your hand. There is somebody walking around with a combination of pens as well as note cards. So you can write down that question and we'll try to get to the questions at the end. During an era of increased polarization, ADL knows the battle to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hate can't be done alone. In fact, it's best done with friends and allies. Um, who I'm very happy to have up here on this stage. Who are these partners? How do we cultivate effective partnerships? And how can we help strengthen these alliances for you and your respective communities? To answer these questions, I am joined by none other than Art Mota, um, who is National Director of Policy and Legislation at LULAC, Cindy Tsai, General Counsel at C100, Alana Breutman, Alana Breutman over there, um, Senior Vice President for Public Affairs at the Jewish Federations of North America, and Joy Cheney, who's the Executive Director of the Washington Bureau and Senior Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at the National Urban League. Let's jump right in. So just by a show of hands, before we get started, I'm curious, have, have any of you out here ever tried changing a light bulb in like the ceiling? Cool, like this, like this. Okay, we got very handy people in this crowd. Should we need help? Um, for those of you who've ever tried before, um, it's much easier, is it easier to do it by yourself? <laughs> it's a little harder, right? And changing a light bulb usually takes more than one person, especially if done in a way that helps us get the job done. Um, effectively and usually with some laughter in between and for us that is our friends and our allies. ADL was founded with the mission of stopping the defamation of the Jewish people and securing justice and fair treatment to all. Our organization strongly believes that we cannot just eradicate bigotry that's anti-semitism but we need to combat all of them. Here at the ADL Never Is Now Summit which focuses on fighting uh, to address anti-semitism I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about how addressing anti-Semitism ties into our respective organizations. Why does combating anti-Semitism matter to our organizations? And in what ways does your organization work in tandem with others to speak out and address rising anti-Semitism? Joy, I'm gonna kick it off to you to start. Well, first of all, it's really great to be with you um, and the entire panel. And some of the audience, this is like a culmination of my entire life <laughs> in this room. It's great. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. It's great always working with you. Um, so the National Urban League, like ADL, shares a common view that in order to combat racism, uh, we also have to combat other forms of bias. Um, and that includes anti-Semitism. It includes misogyny. It includes um, you know, xenophobia and other, in other ways. Um, ableism, a range of things, and frankly, it's appropriate because it intersects with uh, African Americans and people from the black diaspora because we all sit at those intersections. Um, so for us, I, you know, it's not that we think of it as we're fighting anti-Semitism. We're fighting all of this bias um, because it's all interrelated, it's all interconnected. Um, I can, um, a couple of um, weeks ago we did we partnered with women's rights groups to talk about, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, overturn of Roe v. Wade, and you know, we met with the vice president, and we talked about the fact that LGBT, the, the fight against LGBT rights in the states, against you know, voting rights in the states, and against abortion rights in the states. When you did those little circles, <laughs> there was a lot of overlap. Yeah, and we would add anti-Semitism. Um, in there as well as anti-Asian views as well. So, I mean, I wish I had a fancier answer, but that's it. It's because it's what we have to do. It's all the same actor. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that art? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely echo everything Joyce said, but uh, of course, from a Latino perspective, you know, the, uh, our population in the U.S. is definitely growing. Uh, we're almost 65 million strong in the U.S. And a number of those are also Latino and Jewish, so they have a shared identity as well. In some spaces, you know, they question their identity because they either are Latino or Jewish, but fail to realize you're both, then you can be both in the same space. Uh, if you're with Latinos, you might 
feel more Latino in that space. If you're with your Jewish people, more Jewish. So when you consider religion, uh, spirituality, and faith, uh, it's very eclectic in the Latino population. Uh, but definitely, uh, we've seen the uh, you know the hate towards uh, immigrants. You know, we are a nation of immigrants, and we still continue to this day. Uh, our plight is shared shared stories. Uh, even to this day, you know, we have people that are questioning our humanity, uh, whether or not we have civil and human rights in the U.S., whether or not uh, migrants uh, have a say or place to live here in the U.S. Uh, so that's something that we're still fighting to this day. Um, but when it comes to anti-Semitism, you know, unfortunately, Latinos have been culprits of some of that anti-Semitism uh, from their political ideology, from their country of wherever they grew up. Uh, some of that is still remnants that carries on through their families. Uh, so we are still having to fight that within the Latino community, uh, especially you know around election season. <laughs> uh, it really uh, pops up. Um, but a lot of disinformation uh, about that. We've seen um, not only graffiti, but also you know many acts of violence, you know, and even hate uh, that you know are across the country. Um, uh, the not to point out any particular situation, but we definitely have to put a stop to that. So uh, knowing uh, those acts, how they harm folks, and how we can uh, heal together. Great, no, I appreciate that. And Austin, anything, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just echo um, my co-panelists in saying that, you know, the Committee of 100 is a nonprofit organization of um, predominant Chinese Americans who are united by the core principle of fairness and equality. And so under that, you know, attacks against uh, Jewish people or uh, Latinos, the blacks, LGBTQ, and any attacks on humans um, is something that we care deeply about. And we really have to think about the fact that we are going to become a minority majority country. And so this is the time now that we all really understand each other, to love each other, and to recognize that our, and embrace our differences. So, yeah. That's so true. Our, our ability really to be able to, to figure out that, that, that hate is something that we are all combating together, um, and that while they might be you know, coins, like different coins in the purse, um, they're still in the purse, um, and we've got a lot of work to do. I'm going to uh, now point this question actually towards Alana Breutman. Um, which is about our, our moments of, of crisis, really. Um, during moments of crisis, ADL tends to mobilize to address acts of hate-fueled violence targeting other communities. Back in 2019, we were the first call out to Cindy Benavides, um, CEO of LULAC, um, at the attack on Walmart in 2019 in El Paso. This Earlier this past year, we were on the ground with National Urban League in Buffalo. Um, we've been on the ground with our AAPI partners in Atlanta um, following attacks on spas. And really, the work that we do and our ability to rally in times of crisis is unfortunately, and very unfortunately, is, is surprising. Um, we end up doing a lot of work in times of crisis together. But I want to speak to the moments where we're not in crisis. And in those moments where we're not in crisis, where we're not in emergency mode, how do we continue fostering those meaningful relationships? And what are some steps that we can take and our audience can take to ensure that we are really building those bonds around the country? Thank you. And it's really nice to be with all of you today. And thank you to ADL for its wonderful partnership and to everybody on here. Um, Jewish Federations, just to give a little context to the response, is a hundred plus set of um, 149 uh, federations around the country and 300 communities. And we are the balance of the Jewish community um, at, in each of these places. So that nationally, what we represent is a voice that works on uh, fighting hate. It works on fighting anti-Semitism. It works on health care, addressing poverty, um, uh, r uh, increasing security, you know, the security um, program that the federal government runs is something that we have invested in for almost two decades and is something that we all work on together. So when I respond to this, I want to respond to it in both a national way, but also just to understand a very localized way. Um, first, let me just agree that in times of crisis, we do indeed uh, come together. And last May, when there was a real spike in anti-Semitism online, in physical violence, 
um, we all came together. 30,000 people showed up on Zoom to listen to an incredibly diverse cast of leaders. Um, and that was incredibly heartening. It really uh, uh, made, I think, the Jewish community feel safe. And that also happened in Pittsburgh when Tree of Life was hit and the Islamic Center um, uh, came, came forward in Coleville, Texas. And I have to say, when Buffalo happened, our uh, federation in Buffalo that works very closely with National Urban League and was sitting literally uh, next door community-wise to the grocery store, they were there together. But my first phone call that Saturday night was to Joy, because we happened to be friends, to say, oh my gosh, like, you know, tears in my eyes. And so those moments are really important. But those moments, and it's so unfortunate that we've had way too many of them for all of our communities, they come on top of a relationship that's built very deeply day in and day out outside of crisis. It's all that work that um, local organizations in any of our communities do together, the Ys and the Jewish Family Service Agencies, or you know, delivering um, anti-poverty training uh, around tax credits, or addressing um, uh, the uh, uh, disabled community's need together social workers working together. Um, I do believe that is the knitting of the fabric between our communities, and frankly, that is the knitting of the fabric of a democracy. Voting, which we just did peacefully, thank goodness, uh, is an incredibly important marker, but is a marker only based on that fabric that's, that's put together 365 days a year when our communities work together and our and so when it comes to what's the prescription, right? Yeah. I mean, for sure, civic engagement, right? Civic engagement with all of our communities and inter-community and the bonds that we have on, a, on an individual level. Um, and I'll, I'll say uh, a, a few more anecdotes as they come up, but, but those bonds that I certainly see, whether it's in New York or in Buffalo or in Chicago or uh, in Atlanta or even very, very small communities, that's, yeah, no, I, I would agree that there's just uh, so much so much work that you can do in between those moments, right, between moments of crisis. And I want to know if there's any anecdote, anecdotes that, um, that you, Cindy, or Joy, or, or Art want to share as well. Well, it was so funny. I mean, uh, we were just talking. Uh, some of our partners who had worked together, wave your hands, <laughs> we're just talking about the work that they were doing, have done on the ground in Philadelphia. Right, the local ADL, um, as well as the local Urban League, um, which is a national civil rights organization. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would say the anecdote is not as clear, but the, here's what I'd like to say about addressing some of the things that ail us. When we work together all year on things like tax credits and anti-poverty and anti-gun violence and whatever, when we work on those things, that also reduces the likelihood that someone out there is going to be radicalized. And so, that there are bigots all over. But there are some people who are just hurting. And we know hurt people hurt people. So when we try to heal our communities in times in between, well, we ought to just be working together to make sure people have a greater voice, that they have greater health care, that they have um, greater security. When we do that, economic security and otherwise, that there's a pathway of, of economic stability for our communities. When we do that, we're not only building a, other, a, you know, a stronger democracy, but a stronger nation that is less susceptible to all of the things that I think we're very fearful of, those, those things in the emergency moments. Um, and one of the things that we did in Buffalo was being clear that, you know, why was this the only grocery store for miles and miles you know, around? And that in addressing what happened in Buffalo, it wasn't just the hate and the terrorism, it was also the economic disparity. And the fact that our communities can come together on that is what is even more important. You know, you're raising a very good point, which is that all of our organizations, while there's so much overlap in the work that we do, we also focus on so many other areas in addition to, I see Joy nodding, you're like, yes, we focus on so many things. And in fact, no one here sleeps. This is not a sleeping group. Um, they're just like killing the world one piece at a time. Um, so I, I really wanna get to um, really the, the challenges that, that, that 
that your communities are, are facing. Um, and at our organization, like I had noted below, we do really strongly believe that getting rid of one hate isn't, isn't the answer. Um, it's about getting rid of all of it. And in fact, ADL's repair, combat, and protect plans, which are all about combating anti-Semitism, domestic extremism, and online hate, kind of create or echo that holistic approach that we need to be taking to address hate of all kinds. We also understand that while there's certainly connections between the hates we face, um, that there are those differences. As our nation witnesses a shocking increase in incidents of hate-fueled violence, what are the unique challenges that your community is addressing um, that are unique to the communities that you're representing? And how can we work together to help address that kind of hate? I'll let Cindy uh, kind of take the first crack at this. Thank you. Um, so within the AAPI community, we are uh, an immigrant community. And so one of our challenges in addressing anti-Asian hate is really to um, educate our community, to let them know what is a hate crime, what is a hate incident. Um, there are studies that show over and over again that um, victims of AAPI violence or harassment do not report because they say they don't think it's important enough. Um, we need to change that narrative. We need to educate. Um, and I think that's where everyone in this room can really help because you know, when you talk to your API colleague, neighbor, friend, let them know that their voice matters, that every incident of hate that they uh, experience should be reported and documented so that we really truly understand how big the problem is. Um, another issue that I think that is unique to um, the API community now is racial profiling under the guise of national security. Um, I, I don't know how many of you guys heard of the China Initiative um, that was uh, recently uh, dismantled in February, but because of some of the action of the PRC government, which should be called out, um, as well as the tension between DC and Beijing, there is a rise in anti-China sentiment and that translates directly to um, anti-Asian hate. And so we are really working on making sure that we don't um, racial profile anyone really, right? Um, and certainly we do need to hold our government accountable um, if they are racial profiling under the guise of national security. I do want to point out though, I mean, I do not envy the job of our US government when it comes to national security. The threats are real um, and, and, and they have a really hard job, but they have to do it keeping in mind what our constitutional civil rights are and not violate those in the process. Yeah. Well, very powerful. Thank you for sharing um, just where, where, you're, where the community is at right now. Um, anything to add over here? I'm gonna open it up. Um, I'll, I'll just say um, it occurs to me that there's, there's a, a, a history in all of our communities that is ingrained in us, right? We, we're not just people uh, who are acting out of our own um, individual lives, but all the communal hurt, the, the, uh, the trauma, thank you, thank you for the word, um, that we all bring with us and we experience it. Um, you were talking about in immigrant communities. There's obviously an immigrant community aspect here. I, I happen to be an immigrant and a, a big part of the Jewish community um, are immigrants. And so um, so I completely associate with your words, Cindy, about uh, ensuring that whatever we do as a country, as a government, as uh, protection from law enforcement or what have you, recognizes that uh, there's uh, a difference between uh, the hyphenated Americans that people are and what might be associated with um, uh, countries that, that they might have come from mm -hmm. or you know, other, other issues. Um, and that's something that's not new to the Jewish community as um, uh, so much anti-Semitism had also been associated with, um, with uh, uh, the way people have um, undermined um, Israel. Um, but there's also a, you know, a need, I think, 
to ensure that we're speaking to our communities and to each other's communities and really propping them up so that people really own that idea of I, I am gonna speak up, I'm gonna call it what it is, and my allies are gonna call it what it is as well. And I know we feel that deeply in anti-Semitism, but I think we all feel it deeply in all of our communities. Calling something what it is, what it is. Yeah, Art, it looks like you have something to add to the. No, definitely. The, uh, uh, what I was gonna share is that at LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, we're uh, this year celebrating 93 years of our organization. Um, and our mission is to uh, advance the economic condition, educational attainment, healthcare, housing, uh, political influence, and civil rights of Latinos and Hispanics living in the U.S. Uh, you know, that's a mouthful, but also there's much more work that isn't listed in our mission uh, that we do day to day. But all of our work is local. Uh, we have a presence in over 41 states, over 1,000 local councils in addition to state chapters. Um, but as we were sharing earlier, um, sometimes when hate happens, we respond, we're on the defensive, uh, but sometimes we also have to be on the offensive locally, where it matters, where people are uh, locally, where they can see an immediate everyday change. Um, for us, you know, after uh, Uvalde happened in Texas earlier this year, um, you know, we saw a massive response across the country. Uh, there was a lot of money raised, uh, but locally in Uvalde, a lot of that money was held, you know, behind bureaucracy. So none of that money was going out to families. So at LULAC, we started our own uh, fund to raise money. We raised half a million dollars and immediately went down to Uvalde and gave checks to the families uh, there that needed it immediately, families that needed to cover their bills, uh, folks that couldn't go to work because of what they experienced in Uvalde. Uh, after Uvalde, everybody that showed up to Uvalde left, so people were left alone. Uh, but LULAC, we were there, we, stay, we stayed there, we're still there. We opened a community center in Uvalde uh, there for folks to share space, to fellowship. That's the most beautiful thing you can do, share space with each other as we are in this room, and fellowship as we eat lunch later today, you know, share space, be, uh, uh, you know, when you enjoy your meal, you know, share that, enjoy it. Uh, so again, may, leaving a presence there, but also uh, when I was talking about Uvalde locally, one of the fathers of one of the uh, girls that, that died uh, felt compelled to leave a lasting legacy for his daughter. So they created a new council there and local center to uh, help folks that are going through similar situations, but also to allow future people to share space uh, there. So. Uh, thank you for sharing that anecdote. anecdote but also, um, I think you just invited everyone to sit with you at lunch. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, bigger table is gonna be needed. Um, I, I do wanna kind of, the work you are all doing, by the way, day in and day out, sometimes, especially this past year, the past five years, uh, feels like crisis, what are we doing in between? Crisis, what are we doing in between? And that is an unfortunate feeling. And I'm curious out here in the audience actually even if, if has anyone here felt just a little bit of fatigue just off of everything that's happening or, or what we're seeing? Yeah, I see hands in the, in the audience. Um, yeah, I, I myself um, feel that from time to time. And uh, sometimes it feels like I'm in a boat with a ton of water. <laughs> and we're all there together by the way. Um, but we are bailing it out with a symbol. It is just this work that we are doing tirelessly. And I wanted to ask you, um, you all, as well as um, for our own audience's uh, perspective, what is it that you tell yourself in those moments where things just feel so overwhelming? And what do you tell others? Joy, you already have your microphone yeah. up. I'm gonna so, let you, you know, I actually think about this a lot. And um, it, it, yes. I've heard your thimble uh, example before. It's a good one. Um, and that is definitely how it feels, and it is overwhelming. That said, I would note that many of us prayed for this moment. Um, I know that our politics are all different in this room, but for those of us who you know, are progressive, we wanted a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic President, because those aligned with, you know, with our values, right? to be able to advance and to answer some of the calls uh, for the things that we had been fighting for a long time. There are many things that we had been calling for a long time, but it wasn't until we had a pandemic, it wasn't until we had this trifecta of people who are able to actually advance the policies that we'd been fighting for that we were able to get them. So yeah, we're busy right now because there's a lot coming at us, but we're also busy because it's an opportunity to advance um, this particular administration has put on, the, you know, has, has been able to confirm and nominate 
the most diverse, uh, both racially, um, gender-wise, um, as well as um, you know, professionally diverse um, people to the federal court that we've you know had in a generation. This is a ever not generation ever ever. So that to me will have long impact, and it is a lot of work. But I am glad to have that work because this always works. And we could be dealing with fighting against someone uh, who is trying to hurt all of us, who is trying to use their platform to damage people, right? And we, we remember those times, and unfortunately, though, some of those people won't go away. Um, <laughs> so we, we keep being reminded. So that is really what I'm thinking about, how fortunate I am to be able to do, if I want a meeting, we could have a meeting. When Jonathan and Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, and Jonathan and, and um, John Yang from AAJC, and Cindy from LULAC decided, that the, and, and Al Sharpton from National Action Network, decided that they wanted the White House to have a hate crime summit, we got a hate crime summit. A couple months later, wasn't that easy, y'all? Uh, George and I worked very hard. Many, <laughs> many folks in here worked very hard, but we got it. That doesn't. And it was a lot of work. <laughs> we, you know, asked and answered, right? Um, but that's a privilege. So, because this is what I do for a living, I really do view it as a privilege because I have not forgotten what it was like to be in the wilderness where you were not able to get any of the things that you wanted to get done. We used to have jokes that it was a do nothing Congress and I, you know, <laughs> I mean, we were actually able to get some things done. And so for me, I see it as a privilege. And then I watch the Real Housewives when I want to decompress. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. One of the very true. big profoundness in Real Housewives. Real Housewives. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I'll just say, um, the Real Housewives is great. Oh. I, I do. Beverly Hills has been outrageously good this season. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and thank you, Netflix, for a bunch of think, thinkless shows that we can use to decompress. I mean, self care is so important. And, you know, once in a while, if you just need to like shut that laptop a little bit before 5 or a little bit before 10 p.m. or whatever, that's okay, right? Do that. Um, but going back to the bow and thimble analogy, so what I do sometimes is change the scenery, right? Go to the other side of the boat and help out another your friend, right? Clear some water on that side. Um, just having, you know, it, it, it revitalizes me to be able to see others working, um, maybe a different method, but all really for the same common goal of really eradicating hate. Uh, about self-care, favorite TV yeah. shows? Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanna really second the idea of being grateful for a moment where we could do all this work. I was born in a country that didn't allow any civic participation. And so many people came out of worlds like that. So the ability to work together um, on really important matters, as exhausting as they are, is, is a complete and utter privilege. And while I am now a Netflix junkie, which I'm embarrassed about, um, the thing that actually uh, powers me often is uh, watching the next generation. I have a teenage kid, and I think that generation like gets it and works together in such seamless ways and doesn't recognize some of the divisions that maybe many of us had grown up with and had fought against. And that's, and I, I don't want to be Pollyannish because I don't think it happens everywhere, but that is comforting and inspiring. The, uh, I already forgot the question. I was thinking about the Real Housewives. I think I saw one outside uh, walking down the street. Uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> the, uh, no, but it's, it's great. Bravo, bravo, bravo. The, uh, I'll, I'll wait for my check coming through the TV there. Uh, the, uh, no, I mean, it's great to, to escape reality, knowing what's going on. Uh, sometimes what I was doing is watching all the political TV shows on Netflix, which, horrible idea, rewatching House of Cards and The West Wing. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't know why I did that. I'm doing it again, but it's it's a it's an idea of um you know you know fiction, but it's also real life. Like is it you know are, is real life fiction nowadays? But uh, knowing that you can escape for me, I, it's great to be outside uh, during the pandemic. You know, while everybody was indoors, I was one of the only people outside hiking in the national forest uh, in D.C. And once more people started coming out, it wasn't my treasure anymore. But just going outside and enjoying. Uh, the fresh air and, and you know, the river, you know, it, it, just doing that and also, you know, being able to share uh, technology with family. Um, I wasn't going to speak about this, but also like, you know, the privilege that we have to have technology, you know, our laptops or iPads, uh, you know, this event is being live streamed right now. Uh, but during the pandemic, we saw, uh, you know, the discrepancy of folks that had access and folks that did not have access to technology. Many of us in this room were able to stay home and work from home from our screens, but other folks were not able to during uh, the pandemic. We call them different names, essential workers, heroes, uh, but they're the people that really, uh, you know, keep, keep our work going forward, uh, but knowing that. So uh, we're fighting for that right now too, making yeah. sure that we see it as a civil rights issue, making sure that everyone has access to technology, internet, broadband. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, we found out that one in three Latinos didn't have access to broadband internet. Uh, and you know, tr we're trying to change that, making sure that it's, uh, you know, um, infrastructure that everybody has access to. And, and I'm actually going to bring up another question about exactly, al almost like that actually, which are the other issues that our, your organizations work on, uh, in part because I have met with uh, a couple of, actually both you and Joy, I know both of your organizations uh, work on, on those kinds of issues um, quite regularly, to be we honest. We a lot on the affordable connectivity program, and if you all are not doing it, I would check your communities to see whether everyone is very much aware of the affordable connectivity program and how they can get in home broadband at a discounted cost, compliments of the government, as well as money for devices. I think it's $30 um, per month and then $100 for a device. But let me tell you, because what we realized as well, technology is a civil right. Um, and so people are asking, I'm talking the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP. So if you go to getinternet.gov, that was the expanded program that, that is being run by the FCC to allow people to get a affordable internet, good, high quality internet, it, the administration partnered with companies to make sure that the $30 they were getting was actually gonna provide like top notch internet in the home because what we found is people were trying to work on their phone, but you can't do school work and uh, work work and any other thing really on your phone fully. You have to be able to have in-home internet. You have to be able to have a device. Yeah. So we, we the Urban League has been really fighting very hard on that, LULAC has been with us, we've worked a lot together. And matter of fact, it's that relationship, the fact that we were working so hard to get um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed, and which included this broadband funding, a lot of funding. But that relationship is why then, when the hate summit came up and Buffalo came up, we were able to be like, let me go to, go to Cindy. And, and see if she wants to partner on this other thing. Let me go to, we were already working together. So while ADL is not necessarily working on the internet part, all of the other organizations, we were already together on that and it was easy. That's why that in-between work is so critical. We knew that we could go to them and that it wouldn't be anything but a thing. And, that, and that's what happened and that's why we were able to move so quickly. I think it took 24 hours for us to get a call together for the hate crime summit, yeah. And, and I wanna give, uh, that, and that is, that is so true, that the work that we do together um, on the periphery, on the outside, um, sometimes that feels, uh, sometimes it's like so daunting or so small, um, allows us to really build out these relationships where in the future we're like, oh wow, it's so easy to just hop on the phone and, and then give a quick call. So um, I wanna give uh, uh, Cindy actually a chance to highlight one of the programs that we're gonna be working on together, uh, but she knows more about it because she is the mastermind um, of what C100 is coming out with. Yeah, thank you. So we are um, working on a New York City regional uh, program combating anti-Asian hate. And so what I talked about earlier, uh, 
with the Asian community, the immigrant community, not knowing what their rights are, what is actually a crime. Um, a lot of the local organizations, AAPI organizations, are doing their best to try to talk to their community about hate crimes. The reality is, hate crime laws are very confusing. Every single state, for those that do have it, is a little bit different. They're different from the federal um, laws. And what happens is, when we have a API um, who reports an incident of hate, and they don't see a charge as a hate crime, and they don't see justice, they tell that to their family, their friend, their neighbor, and it discourages people from reporting. And so what we're gonna do is work with ADL and a couple of other organizations to um, develop a standardized way of talking about anti-Asian hate. And then educating our local uh, community organizations and the community so that we are all speaking the same language. Um, of course, it's critical for us to be working with uh, ADL because they have, you know, been at the forefront on uh, this issue. But and then also working with law enforcement and prosecutors so that um, the information that we are gathering is really um, information that they need. Right, so, um, and, and to help them address this issue because at the end of the day, um, the community organization, we can make a huge difference in addressing hate crime and hate incidents, but um, we do also need our law enforcement, our prosecutors in uh, DC to stand with us on this fight. So, which is why I am so, so honored to be at this panel with the two critical players in getting the United uh, Against Hate Summit out there. And um, I, I want to highlight that that summit was not just a one day thing, right? So the US uh, Prosecutor's Office and FBI law enforcement, they are have all been tasked to go out there um, to reach all the communities and talk about the work. Um, I was just at one yesterday at Fordham Law School. Um, and so really, um, this is a perfect example of this panel discussion about partnership, about allyship. I mean, no one organization can do it alone, um, no one person, and so, uh, you and know. And we all work on it. And I mean, we all work on it, like exactly. Three of us are up here, but you know, you all, we all were in communication yeah. as it was yeah. being put together. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it was, it's, a, it's a great example. Can I add a, um, I mean, this is small tip. Go, go for really, it. Really short, because um, I was thinking of your original question as well on the different pieces. And, you know, people who work in this space, we know exactly what's being, what's being done, and it's so important for the communities on the ground to see it too in sort of their real life experience. Um, and that, that is very much what we have seen through the kind of network that the Federation support in health and human services. So just two quick examples. As COVID hit, it hit all of our communities differently. And it really you know, increased the understanding um, of, of um, uh, health disparities, the stress of the medical system for a variety of good reasons, et cetera. And for example, the Federation in New Orleans um, partnered with others to create um, a, a project around African-American and, and Jewish healthcare needs and knowledge and both um, uh, understanding uh, the trends and understanding how to address it. Another example, um, there are a variety of tax credits that are uh, vital to people, people getting out of poverty. And um, so we work with Rockefeller Federation through uh, agencies that are uh, Jewish family service agencies where everybody comes through the door, right? It's not just sort of the Jewish community, but it's a partnership with United Way and a lot of direct communities so that people on the ground are actually seeing this affect their real lives. And I think that in addition to these <coughs> remarkable, important events that, um, that highlight the work together, it's that lived experience for all of our community members who are partnering on the ground to support their daily lives. Wow, what a great panel. I'm excited over here. Um, but what a great panel. I am gonna, unfortunately, have to close this out and only because we're gonna move over to Q&A and I'm, I, I wish I could set, spend the next two hours. I'm just gonna have to call y'all individually and ask you questions. <laughs> you uh, do call <laughs> us individually. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and um, I'm going to move this over to Q&A. I believe we have a couple of questions that have come from the audience, and I will direct them. Um, we have some skip flashcards that are coming around right now. If you need to ask, ask a question, there will be a flashcard as well as a pen. Let's see what we have here. Ah, this is an interesting, very unique one. I'm actually, I love this question, um, whoever asked this question. Um, someone asked, can each of you talk briefly, 30 seconds, um, about how they can get involved in your organization, in your work? Um, it's really important. I'll, I'll let uh, Art, Art start and go down the... Yeah, I mean, we, uh, on our website, LULAC, L-U-L-A-C dot org, uh, we have a list of our councils across the country uh, that you can reach out to in your, in your community. Uh, a phone number of all things that uh, you can call someone directly, uh, but also an email if you prefer that way, to be in touch with the local leaders in your community that are already doing work locally. And of course, me, I'm based out of our office in DC, but happy to uh, share uh, those connections on any policy issue, whether it's education, healthcare, housing, technology. Every issue for us is a Latino issue. Every issue is a civil rights issue, a human rights issue. So. Yeah. Okay, so www.nul.org. <laughs> National Urban League, that's our website. You can find us easily. Um, let me make a specific pitch, though. We know that there's going to be runoff in Georgia. This is not partisan. We believe in nonpartisan GOTV. Everyone, no matter of your party affiliation, you ought to be voting and voting in the runoff, right? Um, and we know that there's always a drop in a runoff. We know that it's important for people to vote. So we have a Reclaim Your Vote. Reclaim Your Vote. Um, uh, campaign and so if you follow us on social media you will be able to find it you put in hashtag reclaim your vote you will be able to find it and we will have volunteer opportunities to encourage people where you can call in text in do all sorts of things support the effort to make sure everyone knows how to vote um, over these next 20 days before I think it's what December 6th or something like that before the the runoff election in Georgia there you go Whew. Look for Jewish Federation in your local city. Um, there's no one place where an amalgam of a, a number of wonderful federations across the country, so we really encourage you, get engaged in your local Jewish Federation. Um, so committee100.org, and um, I'm gonna just give you guys my email address. It's the first initial C, Last name Tsai, T-S-A-I, at committee100.org. Email me, let me know what you're interested in, where you want to volunteer, and I will direct you to the right program. Wow, I'm getting a lot of mail. Wow. I love this interactive group, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. Um, somebody asks, um, says that, you know, we do all this work on an organization, national level, and they're asking for those who want to strengthen relationships, person to person, um, which I think sometimes, by the way, it's so fascinating, right? We talk about partnerships, but it feels very here, when really all it is is relationships. We're, we're making relationships happen. Um, what do you recommend um, that they do? And more specifically, I can put, um, no, I think that, that, that's what they said. What do you recommend they do? I mean, honestly, most relationships are built through doing work. I mean, so you just begin the work, and as you do the work, you develop relationships. Um, and, and then you foster them, and then you ask the person, you know, about themselves. I love to ask about family, and how's your mom, how's your kids, how you're all of those things. I mean, that, like, people aren't just the work. And I think sometimes, I can't speak for everyone, but in DC, we can be very much about, you know, the work and, and we, you know, it's, it, it's just, you know, you're like, okay, yes, but what else do you do? What else do you have to offer? Because when I come to work 
I bring my mom and my husband and my stepson and my nephew and my all of my cousins, whatever. I mean, like, because they all, in, they interrupt the day, they call, they, you know, <laughs> all my aunts, you know, they, they don't, whether they're not physically there, but they um, are there in terms of my thought process and what I'm doing mm -hmm. and how I'm doing all impacts like what, how they're interacting with me. And I talk about that at work. And I think we also have to do that even with our partners. They have to know who we are, why we do work. And when you do that, it also cuts down on foolishness. Because when someone knows you, then if something happens that they don't love organizationally, they're like, you know what, I know so-and-so. I met his wife, his partner, whatever. You know me, just pick up the phone and call them. I don't think they meant that thing that annoyed me. Right, and I'm, so it, it's such a good thing. It really is, I think we need to have greater personal connection with people. And also, I think it's a good thing for our, the younger generations that are watching us. You know, we want them to have lives. We want them to have families. We want them to have hobbies, okay? Um, we want them to have those things and we have to have them too. Anything else to add? Ditto. Ditto. I love a good ditto. Okay. Um, this here goes to, uh, to social media um, as well as education, this question. Uh, it's a little two-part, so kind of take whatever you would like, which part you'd like. Um, the first, it's a choose-your-own-adventure question style. Um, what can we do specifically um, in regards to hate on social media? So this is the audience asking what they can be doing. Um, and then they ask about, what about educating people on hate? Big question, this could be a whole panel, but I'm gonna. I'll, I'll, I'll start, that. and first of all, kudos, ADL does a lot of this. So, you know, we're sitting with the right, in the right conference, and I'm sure there are amazing talks going on probably right now on all this, and there's an, an entire panel, but I think of two, two fundamental things, um, which is uh, three fundamental things. One is, we have to be our own ambassadors of, of uh, and teaching people around us to be our own ambassadors of st standing against it and withstanding it and knowing that a tweet is not the same as what actually happens in human life and just taking that deep breath, right? So it's, it's almost like anti-bully training now in like ad nauseum. That's number one. Number two, don't, you know, don't give it more audience by commenting, etc. It's, that's, the last thing, and number three, there are people who are brave enough to stand up in that anonymous environment of social media. Uh, and supporting the people who do stand up is really, really important, and is one of the most important things that we could do. Everybody else add? Or? No, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, what I was going to add to is that what we see on social media, I was still thinking about my MySpace account from many years ago that I was thinking of like, what's the last song I had on there? Uh, you know, the song that you played that really identifies your mood. Uh, you know, if, you know, people's mood on, on social media, you can easily tell what they're thinking by what they post. Uh, a lot of it is that another more job that we're doing in other work is trying to combat this disinformation that's going out there, yeah. especially on social media. Uh, you know, besides reporting it to anyone at Twitter who may still work there and still is working on that who team. Who knows if they're still working there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but identifying that it's, you know, uh, misinformation or incorrect uh, or even hate, but, but doing that, that's the first step, reporting that so that it pops up on, on someone's screen at Twitter so that they can resolve that. You have that. to report it, but you cannot share it. I hope everyone heard what Alana said. Please, because it's so tempting to be like, did you see it only reinforces the algorithm. They don't know whether you're sharing it because you're appalled or whether you're sharing it because you like it. Please, 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 please stop sharing it. Clear, right. concise, it's, to the point. Well, no, because, that is a, it's because very important. It, is, it, it is a thing we are, they yeah. know that that's human nature. And we have to tell our friends and family not to share it because their instinct is to say, can you believe? Right. Yeah. That is their instinct, and it makes a lot of sense. But it is it it reinforces the algorithm, and then it promotes it. Stop sharing it. I'm gonna bring us to I think our last question over there. I'm getting a oh we get two questions. Yes, I have lots of questions. 
There's no, everyone here has been a very good question asker. Okay, um, this is from Bethany, she put her name down. Um, so nonprofits and their staff only have so much energy and time to address the critical issues we face. I forgot what we've spoken about. Um, how can we cultivate a deeper sense of communal responsibility where we take care of and support each other to supplement nonprofits' work? How do we do that? Thank you. That's a <laughs> <laughs> Cindy's like, any way possible. Um, no, I'm curious if you have any, like, either, either do you have anecdotes of what you have, have seen happen or um, what you, you kind of encourage as an organization? Juana, go ahead. I feel like I'm so wordy, sorry. Um, first, yes, thank you, like Cindy sort of whispered, thank you for that question and for that recognition. But um, what we're trying to do in nonprofits is obviously um, uh, uh, synthesize the kind of work that all of us as civic partners in this you know, amazing uh, compact that we have with ourselves, our government, et cetera, really have. And it is do what you can is kind of the answer. What does that mean? Maybe you get involved with a nonprofit and you really are a steady volunteer and supporter. Maybe you do a one day thing, a community action day. Maybe you do something through your faith community. Maybe you do it through your hobby community. It's remembering to, you know, of course, live the values that we're all trying to talk about, but also do what you can, where you can, and when you can. No, no, no gesture, no, no, um, uh, engagement is too small. Uh, people find themselves in different places at different times of their life. I'll just also add um, that you could take, I, I'm gonna encourage everyone to take what they are passionate about and their issue. If they can't commit um, to a full day or um, sit on the board to bring it to your workplace. Like talk about what you are learning here today. Talk to your HR and your management about um, supporting nonprofits, whether it's through um, financial donations, FYI, Giving Tuesday is coming up, um, where they or you know pro bono uh, services. I, I think leaning on your employer a lot. Um, can be really helpful. We find that like nonprofits, we often work with private industries um, because they have the resources. And so to um, speak to you know your HR or management about organizations that you really care about makes a difference as well. I'm also gonna call out of the audience to Max Pavilia over there, our there VP on. for grief. And with that, I know that we are unfortunately close to end of time. Um, I am so excited that you were here. Um, upon Thank our you panel. to our moderator. Thank you. Uh, and 
in addition to, um, also just very, very happy to have this audience here. As Max said, just to reiterate, the work that we do here is together, but the work that we do is really here together. Um, the work that everybody in this room is doing to move the ball forward to address hate doesn't happen alone or in a vacuum. It happens together. We look forward to working with you in 2023 um, on so much of the work that we're going to be doing as both ADL as well as our respective organizations. We're going to let everybody go. As you do walk out, make sure you do take action. And other than that, just have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much.